Good evening. I'm Ken Franklin for WCWP Star Tracer. Tonight we'll feature present members in conversation along with the music of Fleetwood Mac. <laughs> Seemingly difficult to keep anyone from leaving Fleetwood Mac, Bob Welsh of the group writes songs that match emotions such as missing people and being hypnotized. Same kind of story that seems to come down from long ago. Two friends having coffee together when something flies by their window. It might be out on that lawn, which is wide at least half of the plain field. Because there's no explaining. Imagination can make you see and feel Somebody like me Got me hypnotized Now it's not a meaningless question To ask if they've been and gone I remember a talk about North Carolina in a strange, strange pond. You see, the sides were like glass in the thick of a forest without a road. And if any man's hand ever made that land, then I think it would have showed. And that's why it seems like a dream. This is some live Fleetwood Mac recorded over the airwaves of Long Island Radio. I guess you heard about the Bermuda Triangle. Something going on. Seems to know just what it is. The Air Force won't let her on. What be your hole down in the ocean? Your fog won't let go. I hear some crazy people talking. There's somebody that we ought to know. Haunting Bob Welsh pieces, hypnotized from Mystery to Me, followed by a live radio version of Bermuda Triangle, off of the album Heroes Are Hard to Find, Bob Welsh's last bit of writing for Fleetwood Mac before his departure. In December of 1974, Bob Welsh left Fleetwood Mac in order to form a new group to be called Paris. Now living in California, Fleetwood Mac once again had to go out and look for a new guitarist. Well, as things would have it, they were in luck. Not only did they find a talented songwriter guitarist with the name Lindsey Buckingham, but as well there was Stevie Nicks, who was Lindsey's partner, female vocalist, and writer in the name of Buckingham Nicks. 
On their one and only album is an instrumental entitled Stephanie, the actual first name of Stevie Nicks. Meeting both Lindsay and Stevie was enjoyable. We talked about their experiences with the recording industry as they were part of Buckingham Nicks and grew into the involvement as members of Fleetwood Mac. We are talking uh, in a restaurant, where else, with members of Fleetwood Mac. And the two members that we have with us were at one time performers on their own. They are, I take it, married. They aren't married, no. but they do a good job of looking like they're married. <laughs> uh, That's because we've been together for so long. Stevie yeah. Nicks. That's really funny. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm freaked out here. Stevie Nicks and Lindsay. Did you Lindsay. think you thought we were married, huh? Well, listen, you're together, right? Who knows? He just said we... First off, it doesn't matter, I'm sure, to the people that are you listening whether you're married yeah, or not, like married. but looking at an album cover, the one and only sure. album yeah. that you have together, yes. Yes. and you're married, right? <laughs> yeah. right. So you're not married. Oh, I, so I, my I, father said... Why don't, you get married? Why don't you get married after that cover? You, you're probably all familiar with that, that billboard ad, aren't you? Familiar with the billboard ad? You I'll should kill be. me if you're not. Yeah, because I have the both. Sw the switch names I and have the arrows yeah. and all yeah. that. I have both versions Hilarious. of that. That's why from now on, if anything's written, we prefer to have them say Stephanie so they don't mix us up. So besides not being married, it's even more confusing because the female's name is Stevie Nicks. And the gentleman's name is Lindsay Buckingham, and we welcome you. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> that intro. Starting right off with an album on Polydor, which came out, I imagine, two years ago, maybe? Three. Two, two and, and a half, half, years. Two and a half years. <laughs> it is, in a way, a sad commentary about new releases. Yes. We push new albums on our station. Yes. <laughs> and what hurts is the fact that it has so much good things on it, and I truly mean it, and people that hear what we uh, play on the air say the same thing, and they wonder, where are they? This is before you joining for the Mac. Where are they? Why? They're starving in L.A. And they're starving musicians, and they got the talent. What would you say briefly about new albums that come out and don't get the exposure that it, it deserves? Well, I would say that uh, it's just something that happens a lot. I mean, Soul killing. Um, when when a, when a, a young artist is starting out, uh, you you go for getting any kind of a record deal you can get to begin with, and that was the first record deal that we had gotten, and it wasn't a particularly good deal. It didn't guarantee any promotion or anything. And there's so much more to becoming successful than just having a good album, you know. And Polydor just, you know, at that time they just weren't behind it enough. They didn't they didn't put us on tour. They didn't do anything. So. They didn't give us any money. So we were, you know, we did the album. That was it. You know, it didn't didn't mean that much in Los Angeles, even though it got a lot of play in a lot of different places. Is that where it was produced? In yes. LA? Yeah. And we lived in L.A. where it didn't get any kind of uh, recognition whatsoever. You know. Did you do a lot of concerts though? No, no, we didn't do we anything. Didn't play hardly they they at all, would not ever. subsidize any amount of tour for us. They wouldn't do anything. So, so what can you say? All I can say in retrospect is it, we learned a lot through that, and that it is something that a lot of new artists go through for the same well, reason. That, it really burns me up. I never came face to face with the situation where here two people now join huh? with a very popular group and doing so well, but. I just cannot forget the past. I can't forget these kind of albums, Buckingham Nicks, because they have so much to offer. I guess there might be a way of um, going up to Polydor maybe and trying to get it re-released, no? Yes. Well, they, they might may do it any, on their own, yeah. just for the... They're seeing it as a, if you know, get on the bandwagon type of thing. If they're together enough to realize that we're even in the group, which is... Which is questionable. Doubtful. I'd like to go up there and... Boop, hit yeah, someone. I would say something. <laughs> Uh, about going uh, on the road and that whole trip of two people doing their music, was there, was there any um, negative feelings about not wanting to do an album and get on the road because it's a long road? And look at all the people that are out trying to push their product. What made you to go as Buckingham Nicks? What was there? Hmm. Well, we played in a band for 
three and a half years together. Lindsay played bass, and we both we were the lead singers. The regional group was it? in yeah. San Francisco. Yeah. Just we played a lot, but it was never you know. It, we, we, never it wasn't good. like us joining forces because we were doing enough, the the organ players material. And I wasn't writing at all then, and Stevie And I was, was writing, but they weren't but using it wasn't, my stuff. But it wasn't our element, you know. Oh, what was, was the name of this name? It was called Fritz, Fritz. and it was very San Francisco. Acid asked. rock. Was it, oh, in the very hard of, rock. Um, Sons of Chaplin, those yeah, days. Yeah, that, that type yeah. of thing, yeah. exactly. Yeah, the Fillmore. That, yes. that pegs it, right. <laughs> very so, busy, why nervous did you close music. That? Um, the, the band broke up because we had just a lot of... Uh, well, it just got to the point where nobody was being fulfilled in the band anymore. I was where I wanted to write. I couldn't. Nobody wanted to do. The organ player didn't want to do anybody else's material. But his. Lindsay wanted to play some guitar. I wanted to start playing guitar. It was just a big bummer, you know. So we just broke broke up. And then Lindsay and me were the two that we sort of had similar likes and dislikes in music. We both tended to like some country music and some folk music and some just all you know that going a little more that way, which was totally away from Fritz, you know. And we sang well together. We'd been singing together for three and a half years, you know, practicing every day, playing three nights a week or two nights a week, you know, going to school. Um, so we had a common bond of, uh, of just having a lot of experience together, you know, being on stage a lot. I mean, that is where I was telling Lindsay this morning, I was thinking about how strange it was that that people say to me, well, if you haven't performed for for three years, how come you can walk out on stage and be so relaxed and bopping yeah, around? You know? And it yeah. is exactly because I did it for three and a half years in a in another yeah. band that had nothing to do with Fleetwood Mac or Buckingham Nicks, but nevertheless, it was being out on stage and it was learning how to be a performer, you know. So what were the days like from the time <laughs> we got Buckingham Nicks and gave it airplay and before joining Fleetwood Mac, what exactly took place? Grim. Grim. Very grim. The album got released and, you know, being very inexperienced and as naive. to the ways of the music business, we well, assumed... no direction? Yeah, no we, we assumed... We didn't have a manager. We didn't have... We, we didn't realize that in order to have a, a record that is successful, you have so to somebody have... somebody parked on their doorstep. You have to have a lot of elements going for you at the same thing. You've got to have a manager who's breathing down the record company's throat. You've got to have a lot of different things coordinated at the same time, or it's not going to happen, you know, because they're so... It's so political, and it's so involved in, in the record business. So but looking over it, would you yeah. say you might have been in a rush to get an album out? You mm. had songs written... And we had them all demoed out on a four track. We had no, that was the only thing we could do. I mean, we didn't have, we didn't have the money to like pay a group to pay to a group together. to to get together and, and just go out and play live. That was, I mean, it seemed to us that that was about the only logical direction to get some help in, in which else. in which to break into the business. You know, I mean, that was what we wanted to do: try to get a record deal. You know, for some that was just that the was direction we went in. So we, the album was released, and, and uh, you know, and we had very high hopes because we knew it was a good album, and so... And a lot of work went into it, you know? I mean, a lot of time and a lot of... Yeah. A lot of Lindsay's in my soul is in that album because that's, the songs were conglomerated together over a period of about a year and a half before that and all demoed on a four track that Lindsay bought, an Ampex four track, completely, the whole album's completely demoed off really nicely, really well. So we had, I mean, it was just us, our us, you know, and that's that's what we hoped that people would feel, you know. That's why that picture, that's why the cover picture, because that's really what that album was, was was just me and him, you know. No Gugas, no, uh, he played most of the stuff on it, you know. He arranged everything, he produced it. Um, it And it was just us. What can you say, any comments on any of the songs on that album? I know there's a song, I think it's called Freeze or something, that's Frozen like, Love, like a seven minute yeah. song, Frozen, and Frozen I believe Love. it is on the Fleetwood Mac album, no? No, no that's, Crystal that's, that's Crystal. Crystal. Crystal is, right. So, before getting to Fleetwood Mac and your outlet with this new venture, what can you say about the songs on Buckingham Nicks? Any sort of comments is, at all, because we are going to clean off the dust, although there's not much dust <laughs> accumulated since we aired, but getting back to that album, 
any comments on any of those songs? That those, all of the songs on that album are very special. They're very personal. Like, very personal songs. Pretty much. You know? I mean, when that album was released, my best friend called me up from San Francisco and said, well, why didn't you just release your diary, you know? I mean, why didn't you... I mean, it is so personal to people that know me and that know Lindsay that uh, it was just like they knew exactly what everything meant, who it was about, all those things are real. And this is a very real Stevie Nicks song from Buckingham Nicks called Races Are Run. So many to say, wow, they look together. They look like together people and looking t- at the people on the album, just you too, and the credits all to uh, Stevie and uh, Lindsay. It's together music, but yet you know, this world is not all that open-minded. Not, all, not ready for it's it either. not on ABC, yeah. AM in New York. I mean, what good is it? Yeah. I'm just speaking in stereotyping forms. Of course, there are people that are listening to the show tonight that are into all sorts of music. That's why they might listen to us. But would you say there's any song on there that might or could make it as a hit single? On the Buckingham Nicks album? Yeah. Uh, that's hard to say. Um, we released uh, one song as a single off of that called that Don't Let Me Down Again. Night. Don't oh, Let Me yeah. Down Again, the, right. Right, the and, first encore. You know, that was probably the best shot for a single. say that this, the album was not that's one thing we did learn when we got down to LA was not that you have commercial. to you have to think semi commercial in, in certain ways you know that doesn't mean you have to do bubblegum music but you have to keep it in mind you know well, that's what it's all about music isn't it in a way the really? money comes yeah. actually from that airport hopefully you can get to a point though where you can write and just sort of write something that's commercial but at the same time that commercial that is still thing you, can be you know? really good and still really you you know you you, you sit down and try to write a commercial song you flunk out every time you you start writing something that is so dumb that you just start going retching you know so you just have to get to a point where you do have an ear for commerciality yourself as you're writing but you're not really you know thinking about it so much 
that's that is what happened in LA. You asked, you know, what what it was like between the time of the release of that album and the time of Fleetwood Mac. And what happened was we had very high hopes, and then we began to realize as time went by, and as the album didn't really do that well, and that we kept getting adversities from the record company and just no communication, that there's a lot more involved than just doing a nice work, you know. Artsy Crafty album. So that was a big disappointment, you know, and it took us a year or longer to of just kind of spacing, spacing out, you yeah. know. But it was it was very disappointing, yeah. and and it t did take us a long time to, to kind of regroup and figure out what we were going to do. And it's funny, we had just decided like a month before the Fleetwood Mac thing happened that we were going to go in and, and cut some new tunes in in the studio. We were going to make a like a speculation, a spec deal with this uh, guy who the owned guy the studio. The guy studio where we cut In which he would give us, give us time to cut master tracks and, and if, if it got sold afterwards, we would give him, you know, a couple of points off the album. But yeah. he literally gave us the, the studio and said, and here it is. Go ahead. And we had just started doing that, time. and the Fleetwood Mac thing happened. So, like four or five days after we went in, we'd been cutting for four days, and then that's when that happened. But you liked music so much that there was no way that you were going to just pack up the bags. Oh, and, um, oh no. That's amazing. That's what musicians are about. People that haven't made it yet, they'll say they're going to do it all. There was no way, though. Um, Another company could buy the rights, you know, all the technical aspects of the record business, buy another the company rights from had wanted to. and were you trying to push that? No. Kind of no. We sort of let it go. Why? Because it was almost like we didn't have the, we didn't know the right people, we didn't have any guidance, we didn't know, you know, you, that slammed doors in your face, you know. So we, we just sort of... Uh, Got a lot of doors slammed in our faces. We did try to, to get another record deal for a long time through our managers, and I think that, that they just weren't presenting us right to the record companies, you know, and, uh, and however, we got turned down by many, many records. See, companies. we never got the chance. I mean, like, we, if you, you, you come and you see Lindsay and me on stage, you know, well, we could have been, I mean, if we're coming across as seasoned performers now, we could have come across as the same seasoned performers a year ago. But nobody gave us the chance. We never nobody had the money to keep a band together. Do anything, you know. You know? We we had some really good friends that played with us, but God, I mean, they were starving too. You know, they could only hang in there for so long before they had to get another gig. You know, and uh, it 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 upsets me almost to think like that we had these managers um, in L.A. that are good managers. They manage a lot of very famous people, but they just didn't know what to do with us. So therefore, they, I mean, they advised us to play top 40 yeah, clubs, you know, clubs. like Charlie Brown's and uh, Chuck Steakhouse and that type, of, yeah, that type of thing, you know, and we didn't want to do it. So we just said, no way. That will despecialize our music so much that it's not worth it. We'll keep our music at home special and work at something else to make money. Well, I guess you could put in your own words about teaming up with Fleetwood Mac, but to digress slightly, can you see in all seriousness staying with Fleetwood for a while, and getting your act together with them, and then trying to go back to Buckingham Nick's days? It must be tempting. No. Well, it all depends on what happens. I mean, like, Lindsay and I always have each other musically, you know. Um, we just, we're leaving pretty much at this point, just leaving that open. You know, if, if Fleetwood Mac is together and is a good group and is fun, if it is fun, then that is a big part of it right now, you know, because we're working really hard, and as soon as it really starts becoming not fun anymore, you know, then I think that's when you'd really start to question. But as long as the group is, is going well, there, there would be no reason for us to. But sure, I mean, you, you know, if Fleetwood Mac were to break up, which you never know. Never I mean, you just never know. Never. You know? I mean, they just go on forever. They get rid of really, you know, and they just keep going, really you know. I mean, really, really, really. So, you know, you just don't, you know, you don't really, I mean, like I said, we have, we can always go back to seeing just us. That's there, you know. That I mean, that's there in Fleetwood Mac anyway, you know. That's, that's not something anybody can take away from us as long as we're playing together. So, uh, who knows? 
And this is the last song on the album by Buckingham Nicks, co-written by Stevie and Lindsay. It's called Frozen Love. You may not be 